again, I'm Gene Davis. I uh, am VP of Product Management at Splice Machine, and I'll be walking you through uh, a new product that Splice Machine has called ML Manager. It embeds ML flow in it and incorporates some Apache Spark as well, and I'm here to talk about that today. First, a little bit about Splice Machine, in case you aren't aware of it. Uh, what is Splice Machine? It's a scale-out RDBMS. It enables simultaneous transactions, or OLTP and analytics, OLAP, and it powers operational AI. I'm gonna get back to that a little bit later on. Uh, but it's the ability to run AI applications in real time, which is uh, important to us and hence why I'm gonna get back to it in a little bit. Uh, who uses Splice Machine? Uh, many companies do, they're in the financial services area, healthcare, supply chain, et cetera. Uh, one key example uh, is a customer that's got seven petabytes of data cranking through two billion record updates daily, two million queries a day uh, with sub to uh, sub-second, two million sub-second response time on their processing. Um, how do we do this? Well, we've got a transactional SQL engine that sits on top of HBase and Spark, what we call our dual engine architecture, and we've got some intelligence underneath that knows how to route the OLTP capabilities directly to HBase and the OLAP capabilities to Spark. And on top of that, we also have the AI capabilities we'll get to a little later on. Additionally, we have many delivery options as well. You can do this on premise. You can run this through our cloud service or uh, you can run it in a bespoke cloud. Our cloud service runs both AWS as well as on Azure. So uh, we feel like this is a very compelling offering, especially the fact that it's scale out is uh, is a really key differentiator for us. So let's get back to this operational AI concept I was mentioning earlier. So what do we mean by operational AI? First off, a little background. Monty, who introduced me and I, uh, were the co-founders of Splice Machine. We've been doing various forms of AI and machine learning now for uh, literally decades, and uh, uh, the challenge we've discovered has been more to do with the infrastructure of machine learning and AI sometimes than the algorithms themselves, and we want to do what we can to fix that, and that's part of the mission of Splice Machine, uh, and part of that is really addressing these three areas that we see uh, illustrated in this, in this picture here. Now, we're all familiar with the artificial intelligence piece there. You've got your models, your notebooks, um, machine learning workflows, et cetera. But you also have your business intelligence piece. Uh, and that's often staging OLAP information for your artificial intelligence. But it's also important to remember that you've got your operational intelligence. This is your real-time information that's coming in, streaming in sometimes and uh, it helps you make sure that you've got the latest information for your intelligent decisions. All this stuff needs to come together for what we call operational AI to make real-time AI applications. So you've got these three dimensions of intelligence, great. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think about it because the OLAP is like looking in the rear view mirror. And not just that, but you've got your windshield. OLTP is like looking out, uh, out of the real time, seeing what's coming up at you. And your machine learning is like your GPS. This is all great. It's all going on at once, all around you. But your systems that integrate those sometimes they're strapped together with duct tape. They're duct taped together. They're siloed. How is the information getting between these systems? Uh, it's, you, don't, you don't have unified data sometimes. And the reason that this happens 
ultimately causes extra costs, extra latency in the data getting transferred between here. This causes latency in decision making, latency in time to benefit. And our claim to having operational AI is to bring these systems together and reduce the latency and speed up your time to benefit. Just a quick, simple analysis here, example, real-time story here. You've got your uh, person who's shopping in an e-commerce setting. She sees some shoes. Let's imagine, though, that this is a latent setting. She sees some shoes. Later on, she goes back to that website. Uh, the, the website's not showing her the shoes. She buys them anyway. She comes back to that website again later on. Now that website's showing her the shoes. I'm sure we've all experienced this at various times. Why didn't the website, remember I'd already bought the shoes. If the website had the real-time information, it would have remembered, oh, you got the shoes. Oh, now that you've bought the shoes, wouldn't you like to maybe buy a dress to go with that? The real-time information makes a big difference, certainly in this example. Now, when you think about all that real-time information, clearly this becomes something that the data science teams can uh, sympathize with as pain points for themselves. They need this data as well. They ask certain questions. Is my data ready to go? They want to know, too, if there's latency is the data still relevant? Is, are my features still aligning if there has been latency? Similarly, the data engineer may have issues as well about if, the, if ETL processes have changed. But not only do we have these kinds of issues, we're gonna t turn our head a little bit on this for a second and realize that the data science and data engineer people have other issues as well and these are the questions that I think we all understand are life cycle management challenges. What data did I use? What algorithms did I use? What algorithms gave me the best model? What libraries did I use? What even version got employed? Well, I think we've all heard a lot of talks for the last couple of days about this. Uh, and Splice Machine saw this as well. We've been running learning models ourselves for a little while, um, but we didn't have means of doing this ourselves. Last summer, we kicked off a project to take on this problem. We evaluated a number of alternatives to this problem and saw a lot of different possible solutions, but we ultimately chose MLflow to help us with this. Specifically, two modules out of the MLflow package, MLflow tracking and MLflow models. Uh, the reason why we chose these particular packages was that they literally fit within our ditch the duct tape mantra. They, they were easy to use. They fit right in to how we were adopting things. They were open source um, and they helped us um, just continue along with our processes that we'd already established and made them work. And these became essentially the basis for our Splice ML Manager package that we have today. I'm gonna show you this a little later on here, but this is essentially machine learning on the Splice machine stack. It's going to show you how we use MLflow to track models and track and build models and we also have added a module that allows you to deploy uh, your models to SageMaker. How does this look? Here's a diagram. So it starts at the bottom with our platform. I talked a little bit about our platform at the very beginning when we talked about just Splice Machine's basic capabilities. That's where that core engine is. It's you know, the SQL scale out database. At the, a layer above that is the, what we call the native Spark data source. And what that enables is a capability for our, our Splice database tables to interact directly with Spark data frames. I'll give you an example of that shortly. 
And then right after that comes the uh, capabilities offered by MLflow and the deployment automation that we added ourselves. On top of that, you have access to all of your uh, standard types of Python libraries, as well as, of course, Spark MLlib, and we drive the whole thing using the Apache uh, Zeppelin notebooks. Now, the, uh, the native Spark data source is worth uh, discussing just a little deeper for a moment. It's literally an e efficient interface from our relational tables and splice machine into Spark data frames, or back again, as you like, without any serialization or deserialization. And I've just got a couple of quick examples up here for the moment. So imagine that you've got a, a table query that you want to run. Uh, let's say it's a select star from some table in Splice Machine. Uh, this could have been a join or whatever. Once you've made that query, you can make a call dot df, and now you are able to populate directly into a Spark data frame. Conversely, you could go the other way and insert directly into a splice machine table from a data frame with a similar syntax. Now, the beauty about all of this is since splice machine itself is a transactional data set, you're just never that far away from the latest data that can give you full access to uh, just update the very latest updates to your data, inserts, updates, deletes, whatever they might be, fully transactional so that you can get your hands on that information into your data pipelines for your machine learning. Now, just kind of going back to this picture again for, for a moment, you've got your, your platform. Let's say that that's giving you your data source. That, and again, we'll go through an example in a little bit. You get your native Spark data source to help you get that into a data frame. MLflow helps you manage that in your pipelines through the actual uh, machine learning path. And then you can deploy it out into SageMaker. So you've got your full mechanism here, all again controlled through Zeppelin. Now, just to dig a little bit deeper into what, how we're using MLflow, this is again the, the tracking mechanisms themselves. We've put a light veneer of our own, APR called, our own API called ML Manager on top of it. This is obviously just very similar to the ML Flow Manager. This is largely due to the fact that we've obviously been running in parallel with the ML Flow development itself. So this may change as the uh, API and ML Flow approaches 1.0. But essentially, this parallels it. You're creating experiments. We have a set active experiment call as well so that you can hop around between experiments in your paragraphs if you like, creating new runs, and of course, logging your parameters and metrics, and of course, logging your model for uh, persistence. And of course, I'd like to just have this slide handy to remind people where you can reference those very specific calls and how they show up in the UI. Lastly, we do have this UI that helps with deployment automation. So we have a simple way of taking a model that's been saved and, and making a very simple process to take that saved model and deploying it straight to SageMaker. And I'll show you how that works. So again, we have this ML Manager product. We just launched it last month. It's based on the MLflow 0.8. We're, we'll keep uh, tabs as ML Manager, as excuse me, as MLflow approaches 1.0. We heard that announced this morning. That's going to go 1.0 in May. You can get your hands on that uh, yourself today at cloud.splicemachine.com, and the source, the source code for it is out at GitHub as well. And now I'd like to give you a brief demo. OK.
So first of all, I've logged into our uh, cloud service. I might already have a bunch of, of Splice Machine clusters up, or I might create one. And if I create one, I might set a bunch of parameters. But the key one down here is to click this box to enable the ML Manager capabilities. I'm going to skip that for now, because it does still take a few minutes to create one. And we'll just use one that I've already previously created. Once you've created a cluster, you can hop into our Zeppelin notebooks. We always have a whole host of notebooks to get you started on various things from anything from SQL to Spark Adapter, et cetera, all kinds of things. But what we're going to do is jump into the ML Manager. We have a particular one called the Fraud Demo. And that's going to help us walk through all of the different steps of, of using our ML Manager. So I'm just going to hop into that one now. And so the nice thing, as you probably already know about Zeppelin notebooks, is they are based out of, they're composed of paragraphs. A number of those paragraphs just might be um, nicely formatted uh, text or HTML, or they might be uh, formatted uh, interpreted text like this. Percent splice machine means that this is SQL, in particular, Splice Machine SQL. Here I created a schema. Here I'm uh, actually creating my tables and loading my data. I might have actually done some visualization of some data just to get a handle of the data. Let's just make sure we're moving on to actually um, looking at some results. I'm now seeing that my notebook did my favorite little trick of resetting some stuff for me, but that's okay. I'll, I'll get it real, set up real quick for us here shortly. One of the first things that's happening here uh, that we want to do is set up that ML manager. So this is all it takes to get the ML manager going. So we've got that going right here. And I'm just going to keep scrolling past some visualization stuff because we don't really need that. And we're going to start getting into, and I apologize, guys, I didn't realize. In fact, I think I'm just going to cheat and reload this notebook because I'm not sure why this notebook did this to me, but it did. Sometimes the, the notebooks decide to hide their contents. And they, of course, wait until you're doing a demo in front of people. We'll just keep moving here. I think we'll be able to keep going here. All right. I think it's a little happier now. OK. Anyway. I'm actually going to do one other trick that's going to help us. I'm going to actually search for the word manager to help us find where the manager is being used. So we saw that we, we were initialized the ML manager here. And right here, we can see where we're creating an experiment. This is one of the uses of the APIs. And we're creating our first experiment, fraud experiment one. And we're setting it as the active experiment so that we can use it. Great. OK, let's continue on. Once you have an experiment, you can create a run, and you can start logging parameters to it. So this, these are we're now using the API effectively. One of the parameters I wanted to log was to tell the system, let's remember what query we actually ran for what data we're going to actually use in it. Let's remember the data we're using. It's an important parameter to know uh, for the data scientists to remember, well, what data did I actually use? Some other parameters to remember are, well, what was my oversampling as I was doing my data science analysis? Well, the oversampling that was chosen by this data scientist, who was Ben, which was another parameter we used here, was um, two, and so on and so forth, undersampling of one. Now, 
Ben decided he wanted to do some machine learning. And in particular, he wanted to do, looks like some kind of, of uh, neural network, okay? So he's logging some parameters associated with that. And then he ran his test. And down here, we're getting a little bit of confusion matrix, but how did it go? I'm gonna take a look here. We're gonna look at the accuracy number of a high number is good, 0.9992, not bad. And a false positive rate, is, uh, you want it as low as possible. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, 475E negative four. Okay, not bad. Let's keep going and see uh, what else we see. Well now, remember we're using MLflow. MLflow is good at helping us track this stuff. And so sure enough, we've got this fraud experiment one and here's Ben's results right here. We've got the date that that was run, the user Ben, the parameters that were logged, and the metrics that were run. Now, just a little bit later on in my notebook, I also had user Amy do the same thing. Let's go take a look at these two together. We can actually click these. I'm just now using some of MLflow's capabilities. I can compare them. And this is kind of interesting, because I can actually, instead of going through the notebook line by line, I can actually use the UI here and see, oh, okay, well, Ben used a neural network. It looks like Amy wanted to use logistic regression. Okay, well, that's fine. They use a lot of the similar parameters. Oh, but she wanted to use a different oversampling. Okay, that's fine. Well, how are the results? Okay, well, the accuracy is very similar, okay. Oh, but the false positive rates, not as good. Okay, so maybe, maybe Ben's results were better than Amy's. All right, that's something to keep in mind. So let's decide, say that they decide that Ben's is the best result. I'm just gonna quickly show you how uh, you can go from Ben's result, you just basically grab Ben's result here, and now this is experiment two, I just grabbed Ben's result, I can now go out to our uh, deployment to SageMaker and deploy it right out there. I'll give it a name. Ben wins. And deploy it to a particular region. I'll create one. And submit. And out it goes. And so now we've actually not only done some machine learning, we've used MLflow to help us register, log it, compare it, and ultimately choose one and use that to deploy it. Okay. And that's my demo. Any questions? Yes. Thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I have uh, some like curious curiosity, especially in particular, is about, about the uh, deployment bit. Have you encountered any situation or scenario like um, data or module or model is too big and you have trouble to deploy to the SageMaker? Uh, so I think the, the question is about is if the model is too big? Yeah, because the like any constraint about this model size or data size. Is this in respect to uh, MLflow in particular or just uh, in general? For I, I think MLflow particular, yeah. MLflow in particular. Yeah. Because um, I believe like MLflow has a Oh, in terms of the deployment to SageMaker or? Yes, to SageMaker. Uh, we haven't encountered that yet, but I, I don't think that we've tried to push anything really large yet. What was, how big was your model that you, that you tried? Uh, I'm just uh, in general very curious because like I believe there might be some constraint about the uh, size of the model while you deploy something to the SageMaker, right? Yeah, I know that our engineer, I think, looked at that closely for scalability purposes, because that was a concern when we evaluated different approaches. Uh -huh. 
uh, but I'll make sure I, I bring that question back to the team because that, that was a concern. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, just a very general question. Um, so you have a notebook, you let's say created a model. Uh, just before you deploy the model, um, like there's sh sometimes like you need to run some tests or, you know, code review or, you know, version control. So are those like concerns uh, addressed by this approach? Uh, I think it's a good question. I think that I think we're scraping the the tip of the iceberg for the set of processes that we want to evolve, because I, I think there are a set of processes that need to be included in this, right? I think you know there's there's a big a wide landscape between, uh, you know, you're pushing, you're deploying to production, and you're running, you're logging all of these steps like this. So I, I agree that there's there is those steps that you that you're indicating that we still want to do. We, we, see, we have a, actually a big roadmap. We see a lot of that in what the ML flow people are doing as well. We want to stay abreast of that and continue to uh, uh, keep up with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, quick question. Uh, I don't know if you encountered this, but do you know if ML flow works on Scala on the cluster? On Scala. I don't know if I've tried. Has anyone tried? I'm sorry, the next version? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, the first of all, thank you so much for uh, for Jean's amazing speech. And now I'm having a question about uh, data preparation stage, and you mentioned that uh, we are reading from RDBMS, and I just want to know, yeah, m m because we need to convert RDB RDBMS data um, each row into the data format which can be consumed by the Spark, and I, I really want to know how fast we can achieve. Now, this is my first question. The second, uh, question is that uh, so yeah oh, I know that the RDBMS is receiving the real-time transaction well at the same time we are doing the batch job and uh, I know that we are having different lock mechanism for RDBM, RDBMS table so I want to know how can we resolve this problem and uh, I also want to know uh, is this uh, is this platform only for data scientists What's the parallelism for, um, uh, is there any restriction about how many data scientists can simultaneously use this platform? These are all great questions. Okay. And uh, <laughs> let's make sure that if we don't get you satisfactory answers right now that we uh, follow up with you uh, later on. So let's see if I can work my way through these and I'm uh, making sure uh, that I do that, and I might even get some help from, from the audience, we'll see. So the first question I think was just about uh, native Spark data source throughput. And so what we're primarily, re and, and yes, we are indeed uh, working off of a uh, row-based format, uh, but the native Spark data source knows how to work off of the H file format directly. So it's not going through HBase per se, but it's going against the H file. But we're relying primarily on uh, going against using Spark in a parallel mechanism so that we're getting that kind of throughput specifically. It, there, it's not columnar clearly, but you're getting good parallelism through, through multiple Spark executors and tasks. So there's, uh, there's that. Now your, your questions were so many and so good that now I've already lost track of your second question. <laughs> Can you repeat your second question? Okay, so yeah, uh, my second question is that, so yeah, um, we are receiving the OLTP, so uh, real-time transaction. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, always, but in the meanwhile, uh, we also read from a lot of tables, and we all know that RDBMS is having the locking mechanism. So yeah, and there's uh, there also exists some problem like read and write 
uh, and, um, uh, problem. So read after write and write, uh, write after write. So how can we, yeah, so it's also touching, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, suppose if we lock the whole table, so in, which means that the real time transaction, suppose update that role, it may be affected. So how can we address this problem? So in our architecture, we have a uh, lockless uh, uh, format, right? So the way that we work is we use snapshot isolation uh, to do everything. And so uh, we don't lock, uh, and essentially everything is based on uh, multi-version concurrency control. You're going to get uh, a, a basically a, a, a time snapshot for when you get your version of the data and, and that works for even when Spark is going to get a chance to read that data as well. And so whenever that data is going to get read, it's going to get that data as of that snapshot timestamp for, for reading. There is no locking on that data. And so while you're reading it, someone can still be continuously updating that data into that database. The only time there's going to be an issue is if there's ever a write-write conflict if two uh, you know, concurrent transactions are updating the same record at the same time. Okay, so uh, my last question is that uh, for this splice machine uh, platform, so uh, 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 can it support many, many data scientists querying and querying it at the same time? So I think fundamentally it, it can. Um, however, I think that the, uh, there, there are some limitations to the way Zeppelin is configured. And so what the, the way that we have Zeppelin set up is you, can, you, have to have, you have to configure Zeppelin and how many executors it's going to have access to. And so we have a multi-Zeppelin configuration parameter and how many executors each has access to. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>